good morning and good afternoon for some. Um, I am uh, Rachel Bussman. I'm a clinical psychologist and uh, past president of the Selective Mutism Association. And I'm thrilled to have such a fabulous panel here today to speak about bilingualism and selective mutism. And this is for parents. Um, so we have a wonderful um, panel. We have Ruth Brednick and we have Randy Loeb and we have Johanna Siren. And um, I am your moderator today. So just a few quick housekeeping and then we're just gonna jump right in. So we want to thank um, the Gordon and Marilyn Macklin Foundation for their generous grant, which has made a lot of these, um, these opportunities available to us, so thank you. Um, just some information, this webinar is being recorded and so it will be available on our YouTube channel um, I would say by Monday. So you can always check back to our Selective Mutism Association YouTube channel Monday. If you prefer to remain anonymous to the group, please feel free to ask private questions in the question box, in the Q&A box. Otherwise you can ask questions in the chat box, which has been enabled. Um, and we will do, or I will do my best to moderate the discussion and answer as many questions as we can. Um, and then please feel free to register for our next webinar on bilingualism and selective mutism for professionals with another different set of panelists, which will be next Friday. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can see everyone. And I'm gonna read some bios um, quickly so that we can jump in. I'm also going to say in a full transparency to manage expectations, I anticipate we won't answer all the questions today but um, we are going to work on compiling the chat and questions and preparing some answers for um, our viewers. So if you don't see your question answered, have no fear, we will address those um, as best we can. So I am going to introduce our, our panel. So Ruth Perednik is a senior psychologist and her passion has been the treatment of children and teens who have selective mutism. She heads the selective mutism Treatment Center in Jerusalem and has published widely on SM and bilingualism. She has developed an innovative treatment approach, has over three decades of experience and research with thousands of cases. So she's written extensively, she can speak about her integrative treatment approach, um, and she carries out interventions across the world and lectures in English, Spanish, and Hebrew. So we're super excited to have her here today. Um, so welcome. So happy to be here. I'm shuffling some paper, so that's because I don't have all of it in memory. Um, Randy um, Loeb is a founding partner and co-director of Children's Speech and Language Services, and that's in Lexington, Massachusetts. She has over 25 years of experience as a licensed and certified speech language pathologist, and she specializes in social communication and selective mutism in her practice of children mostly three to nine. And she provides assessments and treatment and consultation. She also has been an adjunct instructor in communication sciences and disorders program at Emerson College. So we are, and I also mentioned that she's had a lot of success treating children or seeing children in pairs where one child who's been in therapy models for the child who's newer to treatment, which I think is really awesome. So welcome Randy, it's so nice to see you and have you here. Thank you. And then um, Johanna, who is a parent and advocate from Sweden. So she, well, I don't think she gets the award for the distance because Ruth has a very far distance also. But Johanna is a journalist and a photographer and a communicator who in 2020 started a national SM awareness project. I'm gonna have Johanna say it in Swedish. I'm gonna call it talk about silence. I wanna try, I'm gonna be brave. Tala om tis, tis nad. That's almost right. That's oh, almost no. right. <laughs> yes. And um, the aim of the project is for children with SM to receive better support and help, both in the family and also in their care and in school. And um, Talk About Silence produces various information and materials like books and podcasts and websites. And she has three children, twin boys who are 12 and have SM. Um, and so I'm very excited to have this panel here today. Um, and again, we've, we've opened the chat um, and definitely I love that the chat can be a place where also people just chat with each other and support each other. Um, so I actually really wanna start with a question um, 
for, um, well, first I'm just gonna remind everyone what SM is because I think everyone knows what it is, but I think it's helpful when we have a shared understanding. So selective mutism is an anxiety disorder. It's an anxiety disorder where a child who can, can speak pretty comfortably at home, often they're considered a chatterbox, but not always, has difficulty, they have difficulty speaking in social situations where speech is required, like school or home or play dates or with extended family. And while there can be other variables involved, the, the SM is not primarily due to a, a difficulty actually speaking language or producing language. And it's not primarily due to not, you know, the child has to know the language that they're being asked to speak in. But what I'd like to start with for our panelists is just to speak a little bit about what the difference is between um, what we call the silent period and SM. And then maybe just tell us like how common is SM among multilingual or bilingual children? So maybe Ruth can start us off here. I'm happy to start off. So my original uh, thesis uh, a few decades ago was on bilingualism and selective mutism. I'm gonna have a, a, a personal um, note here that I started off also with my son 30 years ago who had selective mutism and then it was absolutely unknown. We've come such a long way since then. And he was trilingual and then was supposed to acquire Hebrew. And so that started off the research. And I'm gonna start by the incidents. In my research, we found that it was three times more prevalent amongst bilingual children. This has not always been replicated in research. Uh, it has in some, it hasn't in others, but it, it's also my clinical experience. And I imagine also Randy and Rachel and Johanna, you see it that, that obviously this is an anxiety disorder that is basically behavioral inhibition, which expresses itself in, in the, the inability to speak in certain places. So it, it's kind of... Um, logical that if you have a language vulnerability, an extra language, and you perhaps don't speak it so well, or there's also the language which Randy, I'm sure you, you know this better than me, that it, say at home you might know certain vocabulary and in school other vocabulary, and so you're, you're vulnerable even if you know um, the, the language that's required um, right. in, in school. So the incidence that we found was 2.2% amongst bilinguals, um, as opposed to 0.7% amongst uh, monolinguals. That's a really significant difference. That's more than three times. So um, the silent period, I'll just say a, a word about that. It, there is this well-documented silent period where say, let's say my son going from Spanish and English into Hebrew, didn't know a word of Hebrew, so was naturally silent. But that is usually um, for around three months, and it isn't absolute. That is the thing. Selective mutism, children with selective mutism have their own individual rules, but it is very, very consistent, nearly always. In fact, that's part of the definition of selective mutism. And so, for example, it usually expresses itself in both languages. My son wouldn't speak in English nor in Hebrew. He spoke English, but he didn't, uh, he wouldn't say yes, no, black, white in school. He wouldn't say anything. So when the silent period is also expressed by the child refraining from speaking both languages, including his native tongue, then that is a very early sign of selective mutism. And, and he, you know, um, there's a lot of talk now about preventative measures that can be taken. And the, so in the DSM, the definition of selective mutism is that it's at least a month. It exists for at least a month. But I would say if you see it, jump in there as soon as you can, because the earlier the better. And the more you can nip this in the bud or even prevent it if a child has a, a, an anxious nature and is going into a new language is to take preventative measures and not necessarily wait for the official diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I wanna say one more word about second language acquisition is that 
it is much, much longer than we as parents or as therapists assume it is. It, it can be between three and seven years. You know, we think, okay, a child's gonna adapt. He'll start playing with his friends and he'll start talking the, his second language quite quickly. Mm -hmm. But, but objectively, it can take a long time. So that child who has an anxious disposition and perhaps doesn't know the, the, the new language um, will be in that vulnerable place for quite a while. Yeah, that's it's so helpful. And we already have things coming up in the chat. Someone was mentioning um, they, they liked the word language vulnerability, right? And so this also, this is something I think Randy might be able to answer. This person is saying their child not only is bilingual, but also has a speech delay because of um, had some difficulty with hearing for a while. So it sounds like it's both multiple languages and um, a, a language delay. So I'm curious, Randy, what we want to keep in mind about language and how that plays a role. Because language acquisition just in one language is a complex set of experiences. I'm not saying it correctly, but can you add anything to that comment? Sure. So I think uh, any kind of language vulnerability um, is going to, you know, as Ruth talked about, make a child feel um, more uh, inhibited and more, uh, it's, it's an additional stressor. Mm -hmm. So if they're going to be, you know, they need to use their language um, in the school setting. And if they are, you know, don't have a firm, firm grip on the language, if it's a, if it's a second mm -hmm. language um, and or if they have a language impairment, then those are additional stressors for a child that may already be uh, experiencing anxiety or in this case, if, if it is SM, they are experiencing experiencing anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's likely to to impact their, um, their For sure. willingness to speak. And um, also just wanted to add in terms of differentiating between the silent period um, and, um, and SM, you're often going to see these children will, there are stages of the silent period and kids with true SM are going to get stuck in one of those yeah. stages. So you know, the first the first stage of a silent period is um, you know they they are completely silent and they're sort of taking it all in. So this is for yeah. children, you know, it's helpful. children. And then the second stage is they may be repeating words, uh, single words in the second language. Um, and third stage is um, they're practicing phrases that they've learned, but they're doing it internally. And then if all's well, and it's not selective mutism, you're going to see these kids um, then go public and begin and begin to speak. But if, if we're looking at selective mutism, then you know, they could get stuck in any of those first through third uh, stages. And that's, those are, that's a red flag. And you know, as Ruth was saying, we really need yeah. to jump in. That, that's, so, that's such a helpful observation. And I see some, yep, Joanna. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say that, you know, with selective mutism, there's also other issues. Um, the nonverbal is the most like direct thing that you notice, but since it's about anxiety, you can also look for other signs. And a few of those could be avoiding eye contact, mm -hmm. um, problem using um, public restrooms. That's mm -hmm. very common for these children because that's about anxiety. And um, also some of these children, they actually like, they shut down like their body language. That's also, those yeah. are three, signs. Yeah, so. very, really good, really good point. And we're getting a couple really good questions here. So I was, one of the questions is, um, so, um, oh, I lost the question. It had to do with the child's, um, just really more like intervention, right? So things to help. Um, one person said, again, another child with a speech delay, so they feel comfort knowing that, that they're not alone, but um, they've been making progress in Spanish probably because he never felt, quote, comfortable practicing his English outside of the house. And I'm curious if Ruth and Randy can speak about how to interventions and strategies for a parent who's looking to help their child practice either language in the home and out of the home, what strategies you might offer, because I think this is common for families. So um, the, what I tell parents of um, bilingual kids right from the word go is two things. One is 
record, record video and have that on video so that it can be used firstly for assessment but sessions. That's a way of a very easy way and a very common way of, of bringing the child's language, say it's in Spanish, outside and that the teacher can perhaps hear the child speaking in Spanish, even if they can't yet speak in English. But because um, a child with selective mutism is going to have a really hard time going to a speech pathologist and, and starting to speak because they'll probably be silent there, particularly if they're asked to speak in a language in which they're not proficient. I, I recommend that parents, and I really do see, I know Rachel, you do as well, as you see parents as therapeutic agents of change. They are therapists to such a great degree in selective mutism yeah. because the child's best functioning is at home. So I, I, I suggest to parents that they try to have half an hour, twice a week of expressive, expressive, not passive, not listening to the TV, not, not listening to stories, but speaking the second language. So that can be by going out to the store with a child and buying a few fun games and some fun and delicious treats and having half an hour of fun time, quality time with a parent in which they speak the second language mm -hmm. twice a week at home. And just that child hearing himself speak, let's say in English, the Spanish speaking uh, child speaking in English for half an hour twice a week. That breaks a huge barrier and that helps them jump over hurdles. Yeah. So that's something that, that parents can do straight away, even before any kind of official intervention. Yeah. And, and that I is also, I, I would add that I think I saw some comments where my like my child is isn't comfortable yet doing that, but the parent can model that, right? So even if yeah, the yeah. child isn't yet comfortable, let's say again, we everyone's speaking multiple languages, but let's say Randy's my child and English is our second language, even if Randy's not yet comfortable, she and I can go out and I can speak in English and she can hear me speaking, and then we can do our practicing. So it can start with parent as model. Um, Randy, yeah, we had anything? Oh, I'm sorry. So I, I would also add to that that um, that the parent uh, doing that with the child make it, you know, silly and fun, and mm -hmm. th that's a big piece of um, pulling away the inhibition. So to become disinhibited with the play really helps yeah. to sort of layer on. Um, you know, a, a feeling of, you know, this, this can be fun and this is okay. And this yeah. is not a scary thing. Um, so I think yeah. that that needs to be an important part of it. I totally. also, think it would be, uh, it's helpful for the parents to go um, to the school setting, even if it's outside playing on the playground. Um, and this, I think is especially true for kids who are just entering kindergarten. Um, that they go and they play and it can be in their first language too, but to just be getting the child comfortable talking, mm -hmm. being expressive um, in that school setting, the a setting which is likely to be yeah. um, stressful for. Very much. And I, and I think Randy, you mentioned something so important, which is there's can sometimes be pressure, whether it's multiple languages or not, parents can feel pressure to quote, get their child to talk. And doing drills or trying to do something very academic is not likely going to result in something positive. So if it's a young child, bubbles, Play-Doh, something silly and fun, games that make silly noises with older kids, we want to start with fun. We're not trying to drill language skills. Um, I think I, another, sorry. No, please. I think another um, piece in, in the treatment um, is if, if the child can be um, uh, sort of have agency and teach their home language to other kids, to be a leader, uh, to increase their confidence by mm -hmm. doing that. So, you know, that it might be a word at a time. Um, it's also something that the, the, the parent can participate in or mm -hmm. the teacher can participate in or for the child the teacher asking the child about words in their own language yeah. to give that child a sense of hey I I know some pretty cool stuff about yeah. language. that's um, so true 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I had that last night, if, if they gave it, uh, a therapist, Karen, who's working with a Russian speaking child, There's, they don't have any language in common, but, and the Russian speaking child has selective mutism in all situations. And he started by teaching her Russian. He's mm -hmm. picking up a toy animal and, and she's saying, oh, and then she's saying English, yes, that's a horse. So that, that's exactly what you're saying. It's like a way of, of giving the child yeah. a feeling of, you know, he is managing yeah. to express um, I, in I do wanna, I, I'm only interrupting you guys because I'm getting so many questions here. Um, is uh, you know is just to to ask a few other questions. One was um, how to differentiate the difference between SM and autism when also there are multiple languages. And um, I would just say for for me because I do see a lot of kids where we have a lot of complex diagnostic questions, is that it's really important to gather as much information as possible from various sources. So that's one, right? So video samples of the child comfortable at home, seeing the child in, in multiple languages, right? Data from school, data from a speech language pathologist, right? I think sometimes we narrow in on one thing and we exclude getting all available information, right? So if autism is on the table, really getting someone who understands autism to be able to ask about developmental history and really, really do a deep dive into the full diagnostic picture before, because I think sometimes we can get narrow and ignore some incredibly important variables. And I, I'll turn it to the panel, but I will say sometimes that means, and I have said to families before, here's what I know, like we can rule out X, but I actually still, we need to figure this piece out. And I'm sure Ruth and Randy have that sometimes too. And not being able to give a definitive answer yet is sometimes disappointing, but I think we do a family a disservice if we make a quick judgment. So sometimes we say, I know that there's not a this, but we still need more information about this piece of the diagnosis. I don't know if you guys would add anything else there, but I think that's important to say. It's very important. It's very important to get a broad um, assessment before, um, you know, initially. But I do want to say something um, for parental empowerment here. Yeah. That the parents see the child in his optimum uh, communications, usually. And autism is a condition which is pervasive in all settings. So I think often what is looks like autism, sometimes a child can have selective mutism and autism, uh, uh, absolutely, but um, it can be ruled out when the parent sees very clear signs at home that they do not have autism and there's good mm -hmm. reciprocal communication, age appropriate, imaginative play and empathy and all kinds of things that, that rule out um, mm -hmm. the, the standard uh, diagnostic criteria yeah. for autism and and we have to be able to rely on the parents yeah um point of view because the the clinician in the clinic or the teacher in the school won't see that you know won't necessarily see that side yeah and i think a parent just said i want to comment here that my son has been evaluated and um oops, sorry i just lost it because it someone popped up um and has autism as well and sometimes people you know, um, confuse the few sometimes, um, but seeing a video of him at home is just really helpful. Because as Ruth said, it's if, if a child is, you know, chatty, chatty at home and, and fully engaged at home and engaging in really, as you said, reciprocal interactions, that's very different than seeing something that's pervasive. Um, I want to ask a question to Johanna, which is really, um, I think we have people from all over it on this call and in different cultures and in different countries. Um, there's different maybe understanding and awareness of what um, anxiety is or what SM is. So how, what can you share about just how culture and, and how, to, how culture influences this and how one can empower, uh, increase awareness when there's sometimes a different understanding or conceptualization of, of what's happening? Yeah, well, I can start by talking about my own country, Sweden and Europe. Um, when I had my sons uh, 12 years ago, I knew nothing about selective immune system. My family knew nothing. They had never heard it, actually, heard of it. 
there were no books in Swedish and there were no books translated to Swedish about selective mutism. So it was really, really hard to get the right information. Um, we started working on this only like a year and a half ago. We've done a lot though. I mean, we've done books and all that, um, but now we have at least four books in Swedish and it's spreading. Now, you know, they need information in our um, neighbor countries in uh, Denmark, Finland and Norway, because they also need a lot more information. Um, and that's kind of amazing actually, that even though it's really sad that it's taken so long for us to get that information, because you've been really good at it in the US and in Canada and England for quite a long time. I mean, I mean you know, We've learned so much from you, SMA and all those uh, okay. places. Um, but it's really interesting that you actually can spread the word in a, in, a, in a really fast time nowadays because of the internet and, you know, social media and that we're all, you know, all the parents are kind of ambassadors for this. So they spread the word easier now than they could before. And it's easier to find the right information. Um, so it doesn't have to, you don't have to do that much, but you can still raise awareness in your own country in diff many different ways. Yeah. Because I still think there are countries that know almost nothing. That's just my, that's what I'm guessing, but I, I think it's still really hard in some countries. Yeah, thank you. And and Ruth, is there anything you would want to add about just culture yeah. and an understanding of mental health in different countries? Yeah, yeah, there, there, is, there is quite a continuum, I would say on, on perhaps four different um, kind of levels. One is the perception of what is normative behavior. And in some countries, I've started working quite a lot with China, huge classes and little individual attention in many of the schools. And so they, they don't necessarily even notice that a child isn't talking in school or isn't comfortable in school as long as they, as they do their academics. And there is not this this awareness, as you said, Johanna, of selective mutism, of, of, you know, is it that a child is suffering because they can't speak? They're considered to be normative often. So that perception and that awareness of, you know, what is normative? I think there are certain societies also where, um, where girls particularly are considered if, to be quieter and modest and that's a positive thing and then you have to say okay where is this modest and soft-spoken and where is this really a mental health issue and, and she needs help and and staff of the schools have to see this also and even the the treating professionals so and then you've got the opposite side of the continuum in America where I know Harvard for like law you have to be able to interrupt other people and or at least you used to in, in, in your interview you know you have to be out there and alpha and and really talking all the time so there are these there are these cultural differences as to what is seen as as normative behavior and I think the thing with SM which is quite clear over, mm. across all countries and all cultures is that a person can speak when they need to or when they really want to they might prefer to be quiet they might feel this is you know this is my place in the class mm. right now but that when they need to go to the bathroom they can ask or they can um, you know, say if the child next to them has hit them. So, so there, there's quite a clear line of what's normative. Um, I think also um, being in a cultural minority can make parents and children feel a bit at odds with the rest of the, of the society. And that can make a child feel less comfortable, but also the parent who has to, you know, we, we want to hear the children's voices, but but parents have to have their voices heard in order to get the right kind of treatment for um, for their child. Yeah. So that also, you know, and and there is even when it's unconscious, there can be a mutual distrust, both yeah. of, from yeah. the professionals in the school and the the person coming from a cultural minority. So there has to be a lot of awareness yeah. and openness. Definitely, yeah. To, I think that, um, still people consider children with SM to be rude sometimes. Mm -hmm. they that they can yeah. choose, you know, yes. but they and can then, choose, they can yeah, talk. And, and that's so important to, <clears throat> whenever I hear the word 
and no matter who says it, oh, he was refusing to talk. I very gently say, oh, you know, sometimes that's, a, that's actually a very common myth about selective mutism. <laughs> and actually often kids really want to talk and really can't. I explain, Randy, it's not like a can't doesn't produce language, but I really get zeroed in on that word refuse. I have two really important questions I want to ask. One is there's, and this is sort of compiling a few different questions from, from people. One is families sometimes feeling very guilty, like this is my fault because I spoke X language and not Y, or should I only be speaking um, English, but not Spanish or Hebrew? So can, can you guys speak about, first of all, we know that it's not a parent's fault, but can you guys give some some actual statements about that. And then also how to reconcile, should we give up our native language or second language? Cause I know we really um, tend to help families around that. So maybe Randy or Ruth can, can jump in on that. So I have some um, sort of strong feelings on that one. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, you know, I'm sure there's diverse uh, uh, thoughts on this, but my sense is that it's it's actually very important for the family to speak in the language that they're comfortable with. Especially, again, I treat kids on the younger end. I think especially for the younger kids, I think it's, it's really important, and this actually goes also for language impaired kids. Um, it's really important for kids to get a foundation, a firm foundation in language in general. Um, and they're going to get that best foundation when parents are speaking in their native language, the language they're most comfortable in, the language they're most proficient in. And children are acquiring a whole lot of uh, world knowledge uh, from their parents in those in that formative time. And that world knowledge they bring with them to the classroom, uh, to other contexts, and that gives them confidence. Um, and I think that's really important. I also think in terms of um, the, the and, and, and Ruth, you can certainly speak a whole lot more to this, but in terms of the, of the bonding between parent and child, mm -hmm. I think if they're using their uh, native, parents are using their native language, um, then that's going to come, that's gonna be a lot more natural. And again, that, that too is, is contributing to, to the child's confidence. And there's also a whole lot of advantages to, um, to bilingualism um, versus just going monolingual. So um, in, that has to do with um, their, their cognitive skills, their ability to, um, to look metacognitively at, um, at learning um, and, um, I keep coming back to confidence, but I think that, that that's a really important, important piece mm -hmm. of it. Um, and parents who are trying to use a, a second language, if it doesn't come naturally to them, may not be the best language models for their child. Um, so and that speaks both to SM, I think, and to language impairment. And Ruth? I'd like, I'd like to support what, what you said about the, uh, the, the most important thing between a child and a parent is communication. And speaking a language in which you're not proficient as a parent is going to affect that bond. And that is really one of the most valuable things we have in life. So mm -hmm. that, so there's certainly no place for guilt, you know, and you don't know what the exact causes are and you don't know where that child is gonna go later in life. Maybe it's gonna right. be a language academic and then this is gonna be a, a huge, um, you know, something that will really enrich his life. But I do want to say that, um, the attitude, and this I see a lot in bilinguals and in immigrants, the attitude in the home to the spoken language outside, it is important for parents to model a positive attitude and that it's not absolutely English or Spanish at home when it's English outside or English at home and it's Hebrew outside that, yeah, we'll listen to the radio and we'll invite friends and we'll break our teeth, you know, speaking the the the, the language of the country or the language that the child will be required to acquire as a second language because children can absorb that dislike of the second language. And I often have kids saying to me, I hate Hebrew, I hate Hebrew because 
it hasn't entered into their home. And this is another place where parents can model, where they can be speaking the language in which they're most comfortable, but not to exclude the second language yeah. that the child is going to have to acquire. Yeah. yeah, it's so important. And Ruth, there was actually a question here specifically um, for you, but I also think it can speak to Johanna for in another country in school. So do, Ruth, do you have recommendations for how to deal with the different attitudes and cultures that may arise between families and schools? When we lived in Spain, we just couldn't get past that difference and help our son. And I think Ruth, this question was to you, but I think different schools and cultures. So can you speak to that, Ruth? You know, I think this is both, it, it's a two-way street and it's both parents and families and schools and mental health pro professionals that there has to be this appreciation of diversity and multicultural societies. And we all live in multicultural societies and that this is enriching our life. And I think, you know, for selective museum treatment, which we might get to, that, that triangle of open communication and of, of going out to understand the other side. You know, if I'm a Spanish speaker in America, so to, to try and learn from the prevalent culture, but also for the school to appreciate what I'm bringing and what my um, specific you know, ways of life are, and there isn't better or worse, There, there's, it's all mm -hmm. good. So I think that open communication and sometimes yeah. parents feel pushed away because they're not exactly fitting the mold. And so I think parents of select museum kids, myself included, Johanna, I imagine you also have been through this. We need some assertiveness training to be out there and to say, yeah, our home is good. It might be slightly mm -hmm. different slightly different values, slightly different ways um, of educating. Um, and then yeah. you have to hope that the other side is going to be open to appreciating you. Yeah. And, yeah. and one last point is I always tell parents, you have to be discerning shoppers when it comes to therapists and schools. Sometimes you're up against a brick wall and maybe you have to look further afield to, to uh, um, an environment that is actually going to be more inclusive and is going to uh, is going to welcome. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I and think something. Um, yes. Like that, uh, the last question about uh, should parents talk, yes. speak the native language or not? I'm also like Rani, I was really positive, and you positive to speaking their own language, of course, because I mean, parents, they do so much already for their kids and mm -hmm. they don't have to take on a, a new language themselves. And also because it's important for the children, because if you have SM, it's about anxiety and with anxiety, it's really important that, you know, they need consistency. So a young child will associate their parent with a language from the start. Yeah. And if it changes, that might be confusing. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, talk where you feel comfortable, I'd say. Yeah. I think it is a good time for us to shift to talk about intervention. And I'm, I'm getting some questions about, again, like raising awareness in, awareness in school. Um, so in terms of intervention, I was just going to say something in a more general way and then bring it to the, to the group. So there are different ways for, tr of treatment. Um, you know, I do, um, I'm certified in adapted PCIT, which is a behavioral, um, approach. It's a parent child approach. I think all of us would say that pair, if we know that kids speak more comfortably at home, then we necessarily need parents to be or caregivers somewhat involved to help us transfer speech, right? And so often treatment for kids who are in one language or multiple languages in heavily involves a caregiver. Um, but we can certainly, I'm curious if there are specific things we wanna think about in terms of working with a school with a child that's multilingual or bilingual, but also intervention points um, for the, for parents to know about um, would be so helpful. So Ra Randy or Ruth, I'm happy to chime in too. Um, shall, I, shall I go ahead, Randy? Sure, why don't you go and then Randy, <laughs> I want Randy to add. Sorry, you got, we're all so respectful. Oh, okay. we are, aren't we? <laughs> so, I, I wanna also just mention somebody, a uh, chat that popped up about someone in India who's having- Yes, I have that in my head because, yeah. yep. Yeah, that is such a relevant question. Yeah. 
And one of the things that parents and therapists and specialists can be so helpful in this is to do psychoeducation, to educate the schools. Really, really hard to do. Sometimes the best thing a parent can do, because a parent can be seen, you know, wrongfully, but can be seen as non-objective, making too big a deal about it. I've been in that place. So sometimes when you invite somebody objective to, you know, a professional to come from the outside and explain what selective mutism is, how just like the parent needs to be involved, the school needs to be involved because that's the main place where it manifests. So there's a bit of a, a, a kind of selling going on. Treatment has to be sold. I mean, you know, it's a nicer way to say explained, educated to the school that they, they need to learn about it and they need to understand that it's part of their duty as much as, as reading and writing is to, um, to do what they can to ensure um, that the child gets what they need in order to overcome selective mutism. Yep. Um, so anyway, that was a bit of an aside. Yeah. But no, no, that's okay. <laughs> about interventions and interventions for bilinguals. I think the intervention for, for monolinguals and bilinguals rests upon the same um, kind of um, methods which is basically helping the child gradually taking small steps towards speech. It's called exposure. And it is basically what is, has been quite widely researched now and it is, has been found to be very successful in selective mutism. And it's taking the speech from home through parental interventions or in my, in my, um, clinic in Israel, I actually send the therapists into the homes first. And I love this particularly where there's a cultural uh, element, multicultural element, because then the, the therapists are actually really the guests of the, of the parents and of the, of the culture. They are sliding in to use the, yeah. the, the select museum term into the home and, and respecting the home. But when that can't be done, the, the speech can be brought from the home into the school and depending of course on the age, but talking about younger children through steps that can be implemented by a key worker, by a parent, by a teacher, by basically whatever is available to initially perhaps bring in recordings, then bring in one word answers, and then maybe speech with a friend who's also been coming home. And so the child has started speaking to that friend at home and then, and, and gradually, one step at a time and I think really in a nutshell that's the treatment yeah when it comes to bilingual the question is whether to begin in the language in which the child is comfortable yeah. and yes I think absolutely you've got mm -hmm. to begin in the language in which the child's comfortable yeah. and then if the child is going to be speaking English comfortably in a school where they're required to speak in Hebrew that's a good starting point yeah. for easing them into the Hebrew especially when they're getting that help at home of the expressive yeah. language. Um, I agree. Randy, do you want to add something? I have a thought, but I'm going to hold it while you add something. Um, sure. So, um, yeah, I will piggyback on all, all of that, which mm -hmm. I wholeheartedly agree with. And, um, you know, it, I think it is super important to have the open communication consultation with the triangle of, of school and home and um, and treating treating therapist, and I have been um, surprised. Maybe I shouldn't have been, but really surprised at how receptive um, the the schools can be and the teachers can be. Yeah, occasionally I run across some that aren't, but I think um, now I can almost expect that receptiveness now. Mm -hmm. And it's been so helpful to work um, with the teachers. And I have found even during this time in COVID, in some ways it's been easier because mm -hmm. um, they, I, teachers have been able to um, join our, our you know, video therapy, our teletherapy. Um, so, you know, we've been able to do fade-ins that way, mm -hmm. which are more difficult to do in the actual, you know, physical classroom. Um, and um, it's been great to be able to share goals. So we come up with, I may come up with the child, come up with, you know, goals, and then I'm in contact with the teacher so that 
uh, she's recommending and telling me what might be appropriate in the classroom. I need to know what's going on there, but also she can implement that yeah. um, in the classroom. Um, and, you know, likewise, sending um, videos back and forth. So, you know, a child might make a video with me, we send it to, uh, to the classroom, they watch it with the teacher. Mm -hmm. And I, I think um, Ruth's point, you know, it's hard to, there's so many different uh, approaches and, and ways to address treatment. And in some ways it's individualized, but, um, you know, uh, to the point of doing it gradually. I, mm -hmm. I think that's so, so critical that we want yeah. to start meeting kids where they're at. That's, that's Then right. we're going to the, to the smallest next step where it's just, it's, a, it's doable, but it's a little challenge, but it's doable. Because yeah. if we try to come in over here, then um, we're gonna get shut down because yeah. it's just too much and it's just overwhelming. Yeah, um, so I think that's such a good point. And I'm just gonna add, and then I'll go to Johanna because I've seen a couple of questions come through, which is like, could you technically go, let's just pretend, go into a school where the, child, where the language is German, but the child's native language is Italian and the school and the parents don't have a shared language, that's hard, right? But it is possible if we start in the child's first prefer, like let's say most comfortable language, the teachers don't have to know the language that's being spoken, right? So you can go into a school, a parent could go into a school with the child and play in the room in their native language. And the teacher just comes by and says, Ruth, it looks like you're having so much fun. Now that teacher can say that in Italian and the child and parent are speaking in German, but to, I think we'd all agree it's about, and Johanna keeps saying, this is about anxiety. So it's about building comfort and we wanna start where the child's the most comfortable. So it's okay if they didn't understand, it's just letting the person know, Ruth, I hear you talking and that's awesome, great talking because we wanna start where the child's comfortable. And Randy, Ruth, and I all do this, but we do it a different way. But I think we'd all agree that we start by building comfort. Um, and so that doesn't, just like, I guess I always think of this and Ruth and Johanna, you tell me if I'm being naive and not thinking of the right way, but I think of it similar to whispering. We don't tell a child to speak louder. <laughs> They're starting in whispering and we have to honor the whisper first and they'll get there. I've never seen a child stay in a whisper. So similarly, if their first or their preferred or most comfortable language is Hebrew, then they, they start in Hebrew. And then as they get closer and closer, maybe it's one word in Spanish and then another word, but we start where it's comfortable. Does that, is that fair to say it like that, Johanna? Yeah, I just that want to say one thing that you can, you can even say to teachers, and I've done this many times, so she's going to say yes or no in English, even if the spoken language is different. But so, so the, the, the communication with a teacher can begin even when they're speaking two separate languages and just That's have right. a few words in common. I, I do want to add something, and this is a question for Johanna, which was someone asked a question of how, and I, it's not unique to you. I think we all have our own families of origin, as we call them. What do you do when a family member let's say it's a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or a well-intended sibling, just sees the parent as being like too accommodating. Why are you making such a big deal? They're, they're your child's just rude, they're refusing, or maybe they just have a different understanding. You're making too big of a deal out of it. How do you help get family members on the quote right page when they're on a different page? Yeah, we, um, we're in contact with many families around our country and other countries, and this is so common, you know. Um, I've had it with family members, like outside our closest family. And um, what I do is just, you know, I keep repeating and I keep sending information to school and to um, family and try to educate them about selective mutism and try to, I always try to like under, um, explain it in an easy way. For them to understand and what I say which are words from another Swedish uh, woman called Karina Engström but she she always described it at um, imagine yourself like standing on top like on the highest point of a, of a um, trampoline is it called trampoline mm -hmm. you jump down? yeah trampoline and you really really want to jump 
you you want nothing else because these kids they always want to talk you know you can't take it personally um but you just can't you you just freeze and you know just try to and uh, explain to them in those easy kind yeah. of ways without without sending texts or documents that are too clinical and too too um too complicated because that can also be difficult but also you know to talk about it always to talk about the silence and not to be silenced about the yeah. silence with yeah. you know some people are and, and that never helps anyone yeah and I also what, what um can I just add I just want to, uh, about the comfort that you talked about, that's always the most important in all settings, you know, never start with having the child talk because that's, you know, that's up here. Uh, yeah. Always start with comfort and safety, like to have the child feel safe. Also with family and friends and, and school, you know, everywhere, um, just be their friend, first of all. Yeah. I, I'd like to add to that, sorry, please. Rachel. Yeah, yeah please. That, that grandparents, for example, when they understand that they can help, they can really help. Mm -hmm. And you can take small steps with grandparents. And to begin with, as you said, be a friend. And then listen to some recordings. And just be present when the child is interacting with the parents. If they understand these small steps, and these will take the grandparents towards a closer relationship with the child plus help the child overcome selective mutism then, then you know I think most most grandparents or family members will want to to be part of that yeah and I, I love that uh, that idea Johanna of making it not like giving a handout necessarily but and I've sometimes used the the metaphor of like trying to think about something that an adult could could get behind being afraid of like imagine if you were terrified of taking a plane or like you thought that this really catastrophic thing was going to happen like imagine doing something that you felt was so so hard like that's and maybe the child doesn't express that that's what it's feeling but it's even though you don't see it as hard or a big deal doesn't mean that it isn't um I do want to get to one or two last questions because it's actually, we're almost at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and I, one question I, and, and it came up for me because I saw it in the chat was just some families seeing progress in different areas and then COVID happened. And I think it's hard to not address that, right? So we've seen some kids, um, like Randy was saying, like some sessions, we've seen some real big wins, like telehealth is amazing in a lot of ways and you can just zoom into a school. And so I love that. On the flip side, some kids are just struggling with some of that change. And is it, I, I, I wanna just caution against the use of the word regression. This is just a personal and clinical thing. I find that when we hear the word, my child regressed, that sounds really like we're never gonna get that back. Whereas I think of like COVID has added what I think is like some real stress, very real stress. And if we go back to Ruth talking about language vulnerability, that means you're gonna be more vulnerable maybe in the places you were vulnerable before. And so maybe thinking of it as a need to recalibrate as we go back to school or back to places that are um, harder and not that it's a regression because that it, to me implies a loss but more we're recalibrating so we might actually re need to visit old steps to get back to where we are so I don't know Randy or Ruth if you want to comment on that but I worry when people say regression that that's like oh man that's so bad we'll never get back where it's like yeah but we were out of practice for a while so we have to re recalibrate yeah I, I absolutely agree with you and and to, you know, hopefully everything will return to some kind of new normal, but we've all gone through a lot of anxiety. So that anxiety has been piled on to the selective mutism anxiety and the social anxiety. Plus, as you say, kids have just been out of circulation for so long and all of that exposure hasn't been happening. So a lot of patience, a lot of belief of the parents that, yeah, we might have to do, redo some steps, but we can. The progress that was made before, we're going to retake that progress. We're going right. to, we're going to, we're going to get back. We just need to start from a slightly different place right. now, exactly. and also address any other anxiety that has been, you know, anxiety. Right. Of, of right. And, and, and I will also say, because I don't know if you guys have seen this, but I've been doing some work where I've been doing a lot of telehealth, a lot of SM work via telehealth, but I've actually gone to some kids' homes now who are live close to me. 
And I've found that um, it, SM is consistently inconsistent, right? So just because you're verbal <laughs> in the virtual realm, I've gone to two children's homes where I've needed to be, I, I've needed to remind myself, oh, right, this is selective mutism. I have to be patient. And so don't just assume it translates from one place to another, you still need to practice. So I remind myself that every day, right? And Randy's shaking her head like, right, Rachel, of course. But we wanna <laughs> remind people to expect that so they're not disappointed. Like, but my kid was talking to Randy on the video, right? But now it's Randy in person. So we have to be patient and go back to our really good, whatever skills we're using, right, Randy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, some, some of my kids have done better on video and some have done better right. in person and, and, you know, now there are kids who, you know, have to re get used to integrating into the larger classroom. And I, I, I genuinely believe that, yeah, they're going to, they're going to be okay. If they, they did it before and yep. they'll get back to it. And it's all about familiarity. Yeah. yeah. Um, as we wrap up, I've sort of haven't answered some of these or posed these questions to folks around, there have been some questions around just discipline and setting limits, but I think sometimes parents of kids who are anxious can struggle to know where that line is and just feeling like they're, they're not sure. Um, and so I don't know if anyone wants to say anything about that. My thought is always, we never punish anxiety, of course. We wanna be really careful about that. And at the same time, it's it's always okay to set expectations and limits around boundaries or within your family. But I don't know if if anyone wants to say anything else just yeah. about I, that. I'd be happy to say something that I think that, you know, I know, I remember my feeling with my son is I just wanted to wrap him in cotton wool and, and no boundaries and he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. And that is a disservice to a child because every child actually feels safer when they have fair, consistent boundaries. It also makes them feel um, that they are enabled. They are, they, there are expectations. They can do other age appropriate things even if they're not managing to talk. And so that builds them. And if parents um, let go on fair, consistent boundaries, of course, not to do with speech. Absolutely, Rachel, that is not right. that is not a boundary because they can't. It's a phobia. Right. But in other aspects of their lives, if they let, let go on that, firstly, the difference between school and home becomes enormous when school has got these very clear boundaries and home, anything goes. Plus, when they get over the selective mutism, they're going to have to deal with that. That's right. So you just want them to feel that they're in that haven where there are adults who know better than them about certain things yeah. and will set these boundaries. Yeah, for sure. I, I know that during um, COVID especially, I've done a lot of presentations just on COVID and stress and anxiety. And I think our boundaries and our limits kind of went by the wayside in the beginning when we were all thinking, oh my goodness, this will be over in a few weeks. <laughs> but all kids, they're not going to say, you know what I'd like, mom, I would like to have more limits on screen time, right? Like kids <laughs> don't typically do that. My son at least doesn't, but they do much better. And I think all of us probably have children that we work with and our own children of different ages, but kids and actually adults do better when we know what to expect. Um, so I just think that's helpful to keep in mind. And in my house, I'm like, this isn't a democracy. It's kind of a benevolent <laughs> dictatorship kind of thing. <laughs> but um, but I, I, I'm excited about the, all the chat, all the q and I feel very honored to have been able to speak with Johanna and Ruth and Randy and everyone's questions. Um, I hope that we can have you guys join again. I We are gonna follow up as, as a community the board, we will compile some of these questions. We will reach out to our panelists to help us answer those questions. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone for being part of our, our panel today. We're getting lots of thank yous from the audience and um, this video will be available, I would say Monday, that way you won't worry about, you know, just with the weekend coming, we will probably have that up on Monday. And that's on our YouTube channel. If you search for Selective Mutism Association, you will find it. So um, thank you to everyone um, and Ruth and Johanna and Randy. Thank you so, so much. Um, I really appreciate it. Thanks. Take care. Have a great bye -bye. day, everyone. Bye. Bye.